Thanks for coming in. I've said this before and I'll say it again, but you're one of my top heroes. Go into these huge companies and just convince them to drop fur. And it's just such a, I'm so happy I met you. It's a very inspiring thing. I'd say the same about you, so Love thank that. you. That's... Basically, I guess the, the, the obvious question is, what led to where you are now? I mean, like, was there an initial moment? So it was always in my um, upbringing. So my mom was an animal rights activist in the 1960s. Ah, right. um, so she raised my two sisters and I vegetarian. Right. Um, and then I moved to Portland, Oregon after college. And I remember getting handed a flyer about going for free. It was like huge protest downtown Portland, Oregon. So this was what year? This would be around 2005. Okay. And that's where I first like saw like the gory pictures and stuff like that. And I went to school for journalism, couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and I was like, this part of me, this animal part of me, that was something that I was like, well, maybe I can make a career out of this. And so um, worked at a couple organizations and uh, eventually found myself at the Humane Society in 10 plus years ago. Right. So it's been a while. When you first got there, were you immediately sort of uh, thrust into the fashion side of things or into a, a certain department? I started in the Fur Free campaign. And so at that point, it was just get companies to sign up to be for free. And what kind of companies were you targeting then? It would be like the low hanging fruit. Like we just wanted some companies to have policies. Right. Um, our approach early on was that we were focused on fur labeling and advertising. So let's go to explain that. So, tell so me that. prior to 2013, fur that was valued at less than $150 didn't have to be on the label or an advertisement. So it didn't have to say anything about fur. We started working on this in about 2005 where it was documented that a species called a raccoon dog was being skinned alive in China. And we started looking at how it was coming into the United States and we realized that the species was being sold and advertised as raccoon, which is a completely different species, not even in the same family. Finn raccoon, Murmansky, Tanuki, but what was really horrible was it was being sold as faux fur. So right. the Humane Society of the United States asked the FTC to look into this. We tried to work with some of these companies to really get to the bottom of it. And it was that there was this loophole in the federal legislation that just said it didn't have to be on the label or advertisement. And we really tried to bring a lot of attention to this. In 2010, President Obama signed the Truth and Fur Labeling Act, which closed that loophole. The most crucial thing to come out of that was the fact that we got our foot in the door with a lot of these retailers, with a lot of these brands, because right. we, animal groups and these fashion brands and retailers can all agree that consumers deserve the correct uh, information. Right. I know a lot of those brands back then were asking, as the Humane Society of the United States, they're like, we'd like to find a humane way to source fur. And I was like, okay, let's go down that path and let's see what we can find. And you start going through every sort of marketing scheme, every sort of certification. You Sorry, you, you're going down this road knowing that, that you're going to come to nothing. Yeah, right. we'll go, we'll go wherever you want to go. But we right. know at the end of that, if you are doing your homework, if you're actually trying to do better, you're going to realize that there is no humane way to source fur. Around 90% of all the fur is going to come from fur factory farms, right. um, where foxes are kept in these little cages. Why are people still sort of so unaware of or, or, or not wanting to be aware of where it comes from yeah. and then wearing it on the other side. Um, I mean, it, we're really, you have to go back to the 80s and the 90s where fur was taboo. Um, you had right. PETA doing these uh, provocative campaigns. You had, I'd rather go naked than wear fur. Yeah. And so fur sales went down, fur imports went down. But what was really interesting about that time was if you look back, there was only one big fur-free announcement, and that was Calvin Klein went fur-free during the, the early to mid-90s. And that was it. Like, I'm sure there were some other smaller brands, but like, if someone that was really big in the fashion was Calvin Klein. And they've maintained that? Yes, they've right. maintained it. But Five comes, and China has, um, is having economic prosperity, and they were always the top producer of fur, but now they're the top buyer of fur. And so, um, fur sales starts going up and the fashion industry that wants to get into China 
they started to put fur on the runways and um, it's, I think there was kind of a disconnect when it came with trim to trim and bobbles, yeah. um, palms, where that wasn't your grandmother's fur. This was something that the fashion companies were really pushing this fur trim. I don't know if it was because the Chinese consumer wanted it or, or something like that, but we saw this reemergence of fur coming back from the mid 2000s to late 2000s. Who is the first big company that you yourself um, managed to convince to sure. sign? So this was the Humane Society of the United States is part of a big coalition. It's called the Fur Free Alliance, and it's around 50 animal groups from 25 countries around the world. And right. on their behalf, I, I, I work with a lot of companies. And I was talking to Hugo Boss and Armani at the same time, and they both were a little nervous about getting rid of fur. They both were trying to find humane sources for rabbit, right. uh, rabbit fur. And I think at one point I was just like, one of you is going to go fur free and get a bunch of positives. <laughs> so you were playing off against each other. And one's not. And so thankfully, um, Hugo Boss went fur free in around 2015 and Armani the next year, we had Gucci in 2017, Michael Kors quickly after that, and then it just went off from there. Right. So I want to talk about the, the psychology about what you do every day. Okay. I believe that most people want to think of themselves as kind people and good people, right? So knowing that the, the, the base, that's what everybody wants to be seen as or wants to be, how do you tap into that and get through the, the, the money aspect and the, the, the revenue and the, all the other sort of layers of stuff. Yeah. What is your personal approach? I mean, my personal approach is this is a business. When I'm working with brands, I want them to, to see that this can be a really positive step and this could be good for business. Doing well can lead to doing good. I want them to see, okay, this is marketable to be good for animals. And um, I don't think this is going to stop. Like every time it's like this full circle where you have more companies going for free, that's getting more consumers to say, okay, this is acceptable. Um, and then this is driving policy where we're seeing more cities and states banning fur sales, um, more countries banning fur production. That's also bringing awareness. Right. And now you're getting better and better alternatives. So obviously you can't tell us about the people you're targeting next. Yeah, no, I think that there's a... There's going to be a lot more. But you're, you're positive. I'm positive. <laughs> There's going to be others. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed the video, then please remember to subscribe.